What's going on there, YouTube? And welcome back to another comic book video. Guys, we are here. We are here. Inferno. This is beautiful work. Now, of course, while I'm recording this, this came out two years ago, but I finally sat down and I read it. Because as you know, I was reading every single X-Men book except like one title, really two titles, to get caught up on the X-Men books so that when I finally sit down and read Inferno, I have the complete picture and get my mind ready for this heck of a story. It is honestly really great because this shows Jonathan Hickman wrapping up everything that he had worked on ever since 2018 when he took over the X-Men titles with House of X and Power of X. Even with X of Swords, with the Hellfire Gala event, Dawn of X, Reign of X, all the different X-Men titles that this man was working on or he has some kind of insight on, it pays off right here with Inferno. And guys, I have to say, it's one of the best stories I have read when it comes to X-Men comics. But on top of that, do not get it confused with the 1990s Inferno event. It is completely different. It's just using the name because it's literally everything going down in this book. Everything is falling apart, but being rebuilt together again for a new beginning for the X-Men books. So that the writers who come after Hickman can now do their own work with the X-Men titles. It's literally Hickman setting everything up for the future of X-Men comics. Even though he is wrapping up his work with the X-Men titles. It is a beautiful, well done story. Guys, let's go ahead and get into this. And so when it comes to the opening pages of this book, we actually do pick up with Charles Xavier and Magneto right now coming back to life. Now, this is actually huge. And the reason why, it has you wondering what in the world is going on. When did Charles and Magneto die? Because if you have been following our X-Men reading order, when it comes to Dawn of X, Reign of X, and Trial of X, you would know that Charles Xavier and Magneto have not died recently, which means that this setting right here takes place in the future. But on top of that, this is a callback to the ending of House of X and Power of X, when we had learned that the X-Men found a way to resurrect their dead people. Because remember, the X-Men can now come back to life with new clone bodies. Your memories are just downloaded into a new clone body that was made for you. It was a new way to bring back characters once they do die. And so with that being said, it's a callback. Literally, because when it comes to Emma Frost greeting Charles Xavier and Magneto, she literally says, Welcome my X-Men, just like he did back in House of X and Power of X when Jean Grey, Cyclops, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, Mystique, and I want to say Angel as well too, came back to life after they had died on a certain kind of mission. And so that is the moment where we actually do pick up with X-Force. Now when we do, we do see X-Force right now on the Orchis Forge. Now remember, when it comes to X-Force, X-Force is just the Black Ops group for Kakoa. Meaning that when Kakoa wants to have things handle and quietly, you send in X-Force. They are the Black Ops group for Kakoa. Now with that being said, right now X-Force is on Orchis Forge. Now, when it comes to Orchis Forge, it is the space station that belongs to a new group known as Orchid. Now, when it comes to Orchid, like most groups, they want to get rid of the mutant race. The only difference about this group is that the people who make up this group came from different organizations across Marvel Comics, meaning that some people come from AIM or S.H.I.E.L.D. or HYDRA, and the list goes on and on. Either way, though, those folks came together to make Orchid as a way to get rid of the mutant race, but to also find a new way to make a more powerful Sentinels to send out there to get rid of the mutant race. Now, when it comes to this forge, the forge is holding on to a very special kind of project. And really, on this forge right now, 
is making a new mother mold. Now, this mother mold is what makes Sentinels at a faster rate. It is something the mutants do now want to come online because if it does, it's game over for the mutant race. And so this Forge is holding mother mode or trying to rebuild mother mold. Either way, their goal is to send the Forge into the sun to finally get rid of it. The problem is though, they have been confronted by Nimrod. Now remember, Nimrod is the perfect sentinel. Being able to actually adapt to any kind of powers a mutant may have. And so when it comes to X-Force, he was able to kill off X-Force just like that. Domino, who has the ability of luck, gone. Uh, Kid Omega, a very powerful psychic, gone. Wolverine, an assassin, gone. All three were killed off just like that. But at the same time, we come to find out, this is not the first time the mutants have been trying to get rid of this forge, but to also hopefully stop Mother Mold from coming online. And matter of fact, this is the 16th time they have been doing this ever since Nimrod came online. And the way we do find out by this... And the way we find out is through two particular characters, Dr. Gregor and Director Devo. These two characters right here, they're the ones who are right now watching recent film of X-Force trying to get rid of the Forge. But of course, they failed to Nimrod. But while they're watching the film, they realize that they have seen X-Force a pretty good amount of times now. And every single time they appear, they just keep dying. And the question is now, how in the world are they able to keep coming back like this? Because if they die, they should stay dead. But unfortunately, we see clones of the same people over and over again. It doesn't make sense. And so you have director Devo and also Dr. Gregor say, then they found a way to make clones of themselves. And this is Hickman right now saying, if you have been reading all my books, when it comes to the X-Men coming back to life, it's not really them coming back to life, it's just clones of them. That is why in almost every single video I say that, that technically they're not coming back to life, it's just clones of them taking their place after they had died. And so right now you have Devo and Gregor realizing that. But the thing is, the problem is for the X-Men is that when they do die, there is a gap in their memory. And so when they come back to life, they don't really remember what happened right before they had died. And director Devo and also uh, Gregor realize that, that they are not truly remembering. And honestly, they get the idea that the X-Men are not remembering how they die or what happened before they die comes from Omega Sentinel. Now remember, Omega Sentinel is technically a hybrid human and um, sentinel that was put together. And so right now, she's the one who realized they don't remember what happens to them before they die. And so that is why their plans don't really change that often. But either way, it's Orchid saying, we are getting better though. When it comes to their attempts, we are responding faster. And of course means they are failing a whole lot faster. And sooner or later, we should win the battle. And so now we jump into the main content. Yes, I said the main content because everything we covered so far was just literally prelude stuff. And now we get into the real stuff. And matter of fact, we pick up with Mormon Taggart. Now remember, when it came to Hickman, he told us with a huge retcon back in House of X and Power of X that Mormon Taggart is not a human. Matter of fact, she is a mutant. And that was huge because for years in X-Men comics, she was just a human, a close friend to Charles Xavier. But of course, by now, she is a mutant, a huge retcon. Now, on top of that, she also has the ability to reincarnate. And what I mean by that, once she dies, she's able to relive her entire life all over again, but keep the memories of her past life. Now, that's a good thing, but also a bad thing as well. Now, when we actually jump into today's video, right now we see her celebrating because what she did, she was able to make a cure because by this point, this is her third time going through life. And so in her past lives, she learned what she was, a mutant. 
But of course, she wanted to get rid of her mutant ability. And she wanted to help other mutants who also wanted to get rid of their mutant abilities. And so she made a cure. Now she thinks this right here is going to be a great thing because with the mutants out there who do want to keep their powers, they don't have to take the cure. But the ones who want to get rid of their powers, then they can take the cure. But you then have Destiny and Mystique appear. And the reason why? Because they know the true outcome of the cure. That when it comes to humans, they're not going to stop. They're going to take that cure and then force every single mutant around the world to take the cure and get rid of their powers. Because again, humans are scared of mutants. It's always humans versus mutants. But on top of that, Destiny knows something very important about Mormon Tagger, which is her ability, reincarnate. And she knows that when it comes to Mora, she's going to live a few more lives, possibly 10. But if she plays her cards right, she might be able to live 11th life. And so right now, it's Destiny telling Mora something very important. And so that is the moment you have Destiny tell Mormon Taggart about her powers, Destiny powers. Because when it comes to Destiny, she has the ability to see possible futures. Not for sure, but most likely possible futures. And so when it comes to Mormon Taggart, right off the bat she knows you're going to have 10 lives, maybe 11. But here's the thing though you're going to use your lives to actually help out your people because it's very sickening to think that you will use your ability to relive life over and over again to get rid of your people. Why in the world would you do that? Now, for Mormon Taggart, she looks at mutants as a disease. Right now, a race that needs to go away. And it's Destiny saying, that's where you're wrong because technically, we are the next step in evolution. We can do a lot of great things for the earth. Unfortunately, you look at us like humans do. Something as a problem, a disease, something that needs to go away. And unfortunately, that is the wrong way to think. And so right now, it's Destiny telling her, I'm going to force you to use your lives as a way to help your people. Because if you don't, I'll be there every single time to kill you because my powers manifest before your powers do. Meaning that if I find out that you try to kill me, don't worry, I'll make sure to protect myself. Because by the time you get your powers and try to kill me, I will be heavily protected. And so I'm gonna force you to technically help us. And like I said earlier, if you play your cards right, there is a 11th life for you. Because here's the thing with your powers. Your powers have to manifest before you're able to actually reincarnate. Meaning that if I kill you off when you're a child, right before your powers manifest more, then you cannot come back to life again. And that's what I mean. If you play your cards right, you might get 11th life. But if you don't, then you're dead at your 10th. And so use your lives correctly to actually help your race but not to hurt your race. And so that what led into Kakoa because Mora did try to save the mutant race by trying different ways, working with Charles Xavier, working with Apocalypse, working with Magneto. And so with all those different lives, she got to this one right here, which led to Kakoa. But right before she had died in that past life with Destiny and Mystique talking to her, you had Pyro burn her but burn her slowly so she'll remember to never cross destiny ever again. And so when we get into the present day, we actually do see right now Mormon Tagger visiting her old lab. Now in the past life, that lab was destroyed, but in this life, the lab was not destroyed, but she also has a journal. And when it comes to that journal, what's in that journal right now is Project Cure, which means that even though in the 10th life, where she had actually helped the mutants reach a new goal and hopefully help mutants save their future, she's still working on that cure. She's still trying to find a way to get rid of the mutant race. 
But this leads into another problem. And what I mean by that is we actually do pick up with Mormon Taggart going back to her apartment. Now, when she does go to her apartment, the reason why it's such a huge problem, because she has no idea right now that she is being watched by Orchid. Because right now, Orchid had the ability to map out every single gate that is used by mutants across the world. Because remember, when it comes to these gates, it gives mutants the ability to travel around the world and also different parts of the universe with ease, with no difficulties in traveling. Now here's the thing though, the reason why Orchid was able to get this is because another group known as Horde Culture, and honestly, they're just a group of old ladies who's all about saving the plant life. Now, with that being said, they were the ones who gave this special key that gave Orchid the ability to map out all the different gates around the world. Now, right now, we actually do pick up with the Paris team. And the reason why, because when Mora used her gate, there was a huge amount of energy. And usually, when the gate is being used, there's not that much energy being used. And so, they're very confused on why there was a huge energy spike. Well, that is the moment you have horror culture tell Orchis, oh, because there's two gates in that particular building, meaning that besides Moore's gate, there is another gate, and that gate is being used by X-Force, meaning that sooner or later, the Paris Division is about to be attacked by X-Force, again, Kakoa's Black Ops groups. Now, this does lead into Moore Metagger actually going back to her hideout on Kakoa. Because remember, when it comes to X-Men comics, no one else knows that technically she is alive again. Because to most characters in X-Men comics, they watched her die years ago. No one knows that she actually is still alive. And on top of that, no one knows her secret, that she is actually a mutant, not a human. And so right now, she's hiding out underneath the island. Now, with that being said, though, when she does arrive back to her hideout, she's confronted by Magneto and Charles Xavier. Now, this is Magneto and Charles Xavier right now telling her two things. One, they have tried so many times to actually stop Nimrod, and of course, they have failed. But two, they're kind of wondering, what if we don't fight against machines but try to work with the machines. Because what Jonathan Hickman is saying, you have three groups, mutants, humans, and machines. And so why not the mutants work with machines as a way to take care of the humans or defend themselves against the human race? It's the only way to keep mutants alive. Why not work with machines? Now, when it comes to Mormon Taggart, she tells them right off the bat, that is a bad idea. The two things they need to worry about, one is Nimrod, and two is Destiny. And the reason why, because remember, in this timeline, Destiny is dead. She is still dead. She has not been brought back to life yet. And what Mormon Taggart is saying right now, you have to worry about Nimrod, but also make sure Destiny does not come back to life. Because if she does, she will ruin everything you built here on this island. Now... On top of that as well, she does find out that Charles Xavier and Magneto have been keeping tabs on her, been watching her, following her, all her different moves. And of course, she does get upset by that, but she has no choice because they want to make sure that she is okay. Now, to make sure that Destiny does not have the ability to actually come back, she wants Magneto and Charles Xavier to do two things to make sure that Destiny cannot come back. And so first, she tells Magneto, make sure to destroy all the backups of Destiny. Because remember, every mutant has a backup stored in Cerebro as a way for Charles Xavier to make sure that once your new body is made, your new clone body, he'll be able to actually download your memories into that new clone body. And so right now, is her telling Magneto, I need you to go ahead and delete all the backups for Destiny. All her backups and Cerebro gone now. 
And you have Charles Xavier go see Mr. Sinister. And the reason why, because he's holding on to every single DNA sample of mutants left and right. And to make sure that Destiny cannot be brought back at all, we have to destroy her also her DNA samples as well to definitely make sure there is no possible way for her to come back at all. And so you have Charles and Magneto right now going to the island to get the backups, going to see Sinister to get the DNA samples and destroy both backups and DNA to keep Destiny from coming back to life. Because the more, if Destiny does come back, it could ruin everything for Kakoa. But then we pick up with Cypher. Now, when we do, this is also very important. And let me tell you right now, Cypher is going to play a very important role here. And the reason why I'm saying that, because when it comes to Cypher, we have to remember that he has the ability to speak any language across the universe, to communicate with anybody he wants to. And so he was the only person able to communicate with Kakoa. No one else could do that. And so right now you have him going over to Kakoa to communicate and see how is everything going across the island. Now, he also has his friend Warlock here as well. And I'll explain more about Warlock down the road. But just know that Cypher is going to play a very important role here. Now, this is Jonathan Hickman also setting up things for down the road, like, for example, captains. Now, captains are very important to the island of Kakoa, and the reason why, because unlike the Quiet Council, when it comes to the captains, they're the ones who protect the island from any kind of harm, meaning that if the island is under attack, they're the ones who lead the charge into protecting the island and getting rid of the enemies. And so right now, Cyclops was one of those captains. Matter of fact, he was the main captain. But this is him right now telling uh, the Quiet Council and the rest of the captains that he is no longer a captain. And the reason why? Because he's in charge of the new X-Men team back in New York. And he wants to lead that team into a future of success. And so right now, he's saying, I can't do both. I can't be captain and leader of the X-Men. So he leaves. But with him leaving, he does promote Bishop to become the main captain of the island. And on top of that, Psylocke becomes a new captain for the island as well to give her a new role ever since Hellions was canceled. And also Bishop because Marauders was also canceled. A new start for these characters on this island. But then we get into the best moment of the book. Well, the first chapter of the book. We still got three more chapters, guys. But we get in the best part. Because then you have the Quiet Council right now having a meeting. Now, another thing more Attacker had told Magneto and Charles Xavier to do as a way to make sure the island does not fail is to get rid of Mystique. Because if they keep Mystique around, Mystique is going to try to bring back Destiny. And if she does, the island is going to fall apart. Mystique is part of the problem with the island, according to Mormon Taggart. And so right now, they're telling us their goal right now with this meeting in the Quiet Council is to remove Mystique. Now, before they can do that, you do have Charles say he wants to replace two empty spots in the Quiet Council. Now... Right off the bat, you have Mystique say, oh, I have an idea. And matter of fact, I have a mutant who will be perfect for the spot or one of the two spots that are open right now. And I think Destiny should take a spot. Now that right there is alarming because we just watched Magneto and Charles Xavier make sure there is no way Destiny can come back. But then out of nowhere, you have Destiny appear. And that tells us somehow she was still brought back to life, even though we saw Magneto and Charles make sure there is no way for her to come back to life. And so when we get into the second chapter of this storyline, well, that is the moment we kind of find out that Mystique was the one actually behind everything when it came to us earlier seeing Magneto and Charles Xavier. Because remember, she and Destiny are technically married, or 
not married. I think they are wives. Either way, they are lovers. And so she's been trying to get her wife to come back to life again. And so when we saw Magneto earlier going to Cerebro and we thought he was deleting the backups to Destiny, nah. That was not him. Matter of fact, that was Mystique instead. She was the one who was actually pretending to be Magneto to get inside to get the backups for Destiny. And matter of fact, it's the same thing for Mr. Sinister. When we saw Charles Xavier getting the DNA samples of Destiny, that was not Charles Xavier. That was Mystique, once again, pretending to be Charles Xavier to get the DNA samples. And the reason why? So she'll be able to actually bring back Destiny. That was her main goal right there. And she was able to actually pull it off easily. And matter of fact, she kept that form of Charles Xavier all the way up to the point where she met up with the five. Now remember, when it comes to the five, they have to work together as a way to actually bring someone back to life. They have to say, hey, we're going to make a new clone body for someone who died. And then Charles Xavier comes in and then download the memories into that new clone body. But the five is the main process into bringing someone back to life. And so with the DNA samples and Cerebro's backup in her hands, they were able to bring back Destiny for her. Now, remember, Mystique really cannot use the powers of the person that she is pretending to be. And so what she did was she hand the helmet over to uh, Hope Summers, I almost called her Rachel Summers, but hands the helmet over to Hope Summers. And remember, Hope does have the ability to use psychic abilities. And so she was able to download the memories of Destiny into the new clone body for Destiny. Now, here's the big thing, though. Mystique made sure that when Destiny came back, she's not the old lady she was back in the Chris Claremont days. No, she is a younger lady. But either way, she has now been brought back to life. This begins the downfall for Kakoa, apparently. But right when you have Destiny coming back to life and Mystique and her are able to get some privacy, well, that is the moment something happens to Destiny. And what I mean by that is when it comes to Destiny, because she was brought back technically at her younger age, but after her powers would have manifested, when she does get her powers, she does get hit with all these different kinds of possibilities of futures. It is so much for her to handle. And so for one complete month, she had to learn how to recontrol her powers. But on top of that, fall back in love with Mystique all over again. Now, after those things were able to happen, well then, by week four, she had a plan. And with that plan, they were going to change everything for Kakoa starting now. But getting back into the present day, this is where things get a tad bit more interesting because now Destiny is back. But let's not forget, Mystique is trying to get Destiny to join the Quiet Council. But here's the big problem, though. For anybody to join the Quiet Council or for any kind of big time decisions for the island, they have to vote on it. And so right now, it's Charles saying, we have to vote on this. There is no way we're going to allow Destiny to just join so freely. Now, Charles also wants to vote on Mystique to remove her, but you have Destiny say, listen, I already saw the future, and that vote right there is not going to go as you think it's going to go, meaning that we can try to see if folks want her removed, but to tell you the truth right now, I saw the future, Mystique is going to stay either way. Now, after that being said, you didn't have the vote begin to see if Destiny should actually join the Quiet Council. Now, Charles, Magneto, and Storm, Back to back to back. No, no, no. It's already 3-0. But here comes Nightcrawler. And because Nightcrawler is the son to Mystique, he says yes, just like that, to please his mother. So now it's 3-1. But then we kind of find out Mystique made sure to get more votes when it came down to this big moment by meeting particular members of the Quiet Council to talk about, hey, this is why you should say yes when it comes to the next big vote at the next Quiet Council meeting. 
And so we kind of find out that she met with different members before the Quiet Council. So starting off with Exodus, what she did was she talked to Exodus about how important destiny can be. Because remember, destiny has the ability to see possible futures. But with that ability right there, they can expect what to come down the road. That right there is very crucial. And the reason why? Because to Exodus, he wants to make sure that Kakoa lives on forever. And so with someone's powers like that, that dream right there could actually happen. And so that's how, just like that, she was able to get Exodus' vote. And so then we see her go see Mr. Sinister. Now, when she does, right off the bat, you have Sinister tell us and her as well that he knew it was her earlier pretending to be Charles Xavier. Because let's not forget, Mystique does have shape shift abilities. But the thing is, she has to be a good actress. And so right now, with Sinister, he's saying, listen, I used to be an actor. And when it came to your acting skills, it wasn't that great. I knew it was you, but I didn't mind going ahead and handing over the DNA to Destiny. Now, the way she was able to get his vote is by literally saying, you know Magneto and Charles are going to want you to say no. And if you want to tick them off, you're going to have to say yes. And just like that, he was down because he loves the idea of ticking off Magneto and Charles Xavier. Then this leads into uh, Sebastian Shaw, because remember, he's also a member of the Quiet Council. But how in the world did she get his vote? Now, Mystique knew right off the bat that nothing she buys would definitely get him on her side, because this is the man who has the ability to buy almost anything he wants to buy in the world or he finds intriguing to buy. And so right now she had to think of something different. And what she says is that you know Emma Frost is going to say no, which means that if you want to tick her off, all you got to do is just say yes. Go against her vote. And just like that, you have Sebastian Shaw say, oh, you know what? You're right. I'm going to say yes to that idea right there as a way to tick off Emma Frost. So now she had another vote. But then she also gets Emma Frost. And this is huge because, again, she just told Sebastian Shaw that if Emma Frost says no, you're going to say yes. But he already said yes in the actual Quiet Council meeting. But we kind of find out Mystique still met with Emma Frost. And she was also able to get Emma Frost on her side by giving Emma Frost something very important, some kind of precious item. And I bet you this item is going to play a role down the road in later books. But either way, she now has Emma Frost on her side. And so just like that, Charles Xavier had lost the vote. Destiny is now on the Quiet Council. And this is apparently the beginning of the end for the X-Men. Because remember, we were told that if Destiny comes back to life, everything is going to fall apart. And right now, Destiny is brought back to life and also, she's now part of the Quiet Council, the government body for Kakoa. But then we jump back over to Orchis Forge. Now, when we do, you may think that we're about to learn about some kind of powerful weapon because right now, Dr. Devo is talking to a bunch of scientists about some kind of project that at first is going great, but then the readings say, hey, we should definitely hit the brakes. Now, once they all leave the room, we actually focus on Nimrod and Omega Sentinel. And this is where things get pretty more crazy because you didn't have uh, Nimrod realize that he has been watched by Omega Sentinel for a very good period of time. And so he tells her, hey, I realize that you have been watching me. And she says, I realize that you realize that I was watching you, but I realize that you were also running a bunch of simulations as a way to age yourself up, meaning that to get yourself ready for future battles down the road to make yourself better. But she then says, I was waiting for you to look at me and then recognize me or actually recognize what's different about me, something special about me. And once he does look at her, that is the moment she says, it's about time for me to tell you something very important. And you're wondering, what does she mean by that? What is so important? And so then we jump over to Charles Xavier and Magneto meeting up with Mormon Taggart. 
to of course give her the bad news like hey by the way um mystique brought back destiny so our plans are right now falling apart and you have more metagra show her anger she is very angry about the idea that right now destiny is alive again now she's so mad she even tells magneto use your abilities as a way to go ahead and kill her off right now crush her helmet crush her head with her helmet just get rid of her but magneto says no because again when it comes to their island, they have laws. And with those laws, he is not going to break one of those laws as a way to protect himself, but to protect the island and what it stands for. And so he is not going to kill Destiny at all. Now, this is the moment you have her say, you have to understand, if you don't actually kill her off, it's going to lead into a small civil war in the Quiet Council. It's them against us. And right now, we cannot have that happen. But on top of that, sooner or later, Destiny's powers is going to show her where I'm at. And once she finds me, it's going to lead into more problems. And once she realized that you guys were hiding me, it's going to lead into more problems. Now, you have Charles say, listen, we can still get the Quiet Council on our side by placing someone in that other empty seat. That right there is going to be important down the road. But then you have her, you have Charles say, also, let's bring someone else in our little secret meeting so that we're able to build a better plan. And of course, he's talking about Emma Frost. Because to him, out of anybody in the Quiet Council, the best person to bring in is Emma Frost as a way to make a plan to deal with Mystique and Destiny. And so that is the moment we see that Mystique begins the process of trying to figure out what Magneto and Charles Xavier are actually up to because her and Destiny realize that they're hiding something. The question is what? And we know what. It's Maura McTaggart. And so right now you have Mystique break into Sage's computer by pretending to be Sage. Now with that being said, the reason why Mystique did that is to look into reports that Sage may have that could have been affected by Charles Xavier. And bam, just like that, she found one. And the one she found is about Paris. And remember, earlier in our video, when it came to Orchid, we come to find out they have mapped out every single gate across the world that mutants can use, especially in Paris. But one of those gates in Paris had a huge amount of energy release. And that right there was not normal. Now, when it came to X-Force, they actually picked up what Orchid picked up. Now, X-Force was supposed to go check that out, but X-Force did not. And the reason why? Because Charles said, do not go there at all. Do not go on that mission. And so neither X-Force or Orchid went to that particular building to figure out what was happening at that building. And so you have Mystique actually go over to Orchid and pretend to be a scientist who actually worked there to hopefully get a better idea about what had Orchid so worried about a gate in Paris. But when she goes there, she actually finds out about their powerful weapon. And apparently their powerful weapon has the ability to use the energy of the sun. And that right there terrifies her. But at the same time, she's still trying to figure out what did Charles and Magneto do about this huge amount of energy that came from one particular gate? What was so special about that gate? And we know what it was. It was Maura Metagger's secret gate to her Paris apartment. But then we get over to the meeting between Charles Xavier, Magneto, also Emma Frost, and Maura Metagger. Now, when this meeting goes down, it's just a complete mess for Charles Xavier and Magneto. And the reason why, because as soon as they introduce Maura Metagger to Emma Frost, right off the bat, she says, hey, something is wrong here. Because when I last checked, she was dead. And like I said earlier, when it comes to the rest of the mutant race, they know that Maura Taggart died, but they have no idea that technically she did not die. She is alive and well. And this is Emma Frost very confused on how the world Maura is here. But on top of that, why should she care for a human? That is something else to mention. Because when it comes to the mutant race, 
No one knows that she is actually a mutant except Charles Xavier and Magneto. That is it. No one else knows. And so right now, it's them telling Emma, actually, Mora is not human. Mora is a mutant. Now, at first, Emma cannot believe that because she knew Mora Metagor for years on years. But then when she reads her mind, bam, just like that, she knows everything about how Mora is a mutant, that her ability is reincarnation, that she had lived 10 lives, or this is her 10th life. But on top of that, though, she's trying to save the future of Kakoa. Now, with that being said, though, you have Emma Frost find out that Magneto and Charles have been lying to her the entire time. The whole idea of the island and everything else about the island came from this particular lie. And so you have Emma say, I understand how destiny could be a problem for Kakoa down the road, but at the same time, you guys lied to me, and because you lied to me, you have lost my loyalty forever. And she walks away. Now, she does promise to help them out, but when she walks away, Mora does mention that right there is going to be a problem. We have technically made Emma Frost an enemy to us now, and it could lead to more problems down the road. And so then we pick up with the next Quiet Council meeting. Now, this is actually very, very important because this pays off what we saw back in X-Force number, I want to say 25. I could be wrong. But either way, remember, Charles Xavier came to a particular person in X-Force asking to talk to that person. Well, when it comes to the Quiet Council, let's not forget, we still have one empty seat left. And so right now, it's Charles trying to fill that spot in. And we come to find out who he's trying to bring in. Now, before it's told to us who he's trying to bring in, you have every single member of the Quiet Council vote. And when the votes are all done, this new person is now part of the Quiet Council. And so you have Charles say, and now, guys, we may welcome Colossus. And remember, we saw back in X-Force that Charles wanted to talk to Colossus. Bam. Just like that, here we go. You have Colossus now part of the Quiet Council. And so then we jump into the third chapter. Now, when we do, we actually jump back in the past. And the reason why, because we're going to learn a tad bit more about the origin of Kakoa. How in the world it came all together. And it all started with Cypher. Now, really, I'm not going to sit down here and explain every single detail when it came to the island and how it was made and what kind of deal was done between Cypher and Kakoa. All you know is that in the past, Charles realized that the only way to fully understand the island is to bring someone who can actually talk to the island, and that is Cypher. Because remember, Cypher ability gives him the ability to talk to anybody, no matter the language. And so he was able to communicate with Kakoa. And once he did that, he was able to make some kind of deal with Kakoa involving Warlock as well. And they were able to build some kind of system to make the island a place where mutants can actually live. And so he was able to accomplish his goal. But the main point of this section right here is that Cypher knows that he cannot trust Charles Xavier. And so even though he's right now going along with Charles' plan, he tells us, the readers, I still do not trust Charles Xavier. And so this actually leads into Cypher kind of really building a system that begins the process of bringing folks over to Kakoa. Because right after he arrived, he was able to make a system like, for example, the beginning of the idea of resurrection. With the five working alongside with Kakoa, they were able to bring back mutants who had died in the past by giving them new clone bodies and then download their memories into those new clone bodies. But on top of that, he was also able to find flowers that are able to grow in the houses to let people actually live in. And so if someone wants to live somewhere on the island, they are able to actually plant that flower somewhere and that flower grows into a house. He has technically made the entire system for Kokoa by himself. 
And really, it doesn't even stop there, because then we pick up with Beast and Cypher, and this is the moment we see them right now creating the drug. Remember, when it came to Kakoa, when it became a nation, one of the biggest things they did was made a new powerful drug. And with this drug, it became their main source of trade so that they were able to build alliances with other countries around the world because this drug was a miracle drug. It was able to do a lot of different things, things they needed to do for the human race, but also the mutant race as well. And so again, it continues to show us that Cypher played a huge role when it came to the birth of this nation. Now, after Cypher was able to build this entire system, you have Cypher talk to Kakoa and Warlock. Now, this is actually very important. And the reason why, because is Cypher saying that he may have been wrong to kind of not trust Charles Xavier. Because remember, when he first arrived at the island, he honestly did not believe in what Charles was trying to do. He felt like Charles was hiding something. And so this is Cypher right now saying, Maybe I was wrong in not trusting Charles, but just in case, I'm going to give him a special flower. Now, this flower right here is technically not connected to Kakoa, meaning that when Charles actually placed this flower, it will be hidden away from Kakoa, even though it's on the island. And so to Charles, it will be his secret place. But in reality, when it comes to all flowers, all plants on this island, they're connected to Warlock which means that it gives Cypher a way to spy on Charles Xavier because as soon as Charles plants that flower, it grows this special home and it's Charles thinking, don't worry, no one can watch us in here. In reality, Cypher can. And we come to find out, Cypher now knows about more Mittagger because he has been watching Charles Magneto for the entire time on the island. And so that is the moment where we actually do pick up right now with Mystique and Destiny about to meet up with Emma Frost. Now, before they're able to actually do that, that is the moment they are confronted by the Stefford Cuckoos. Now, remember, when it comes to the Stefford Cuckoos, they are just the clones of Emma Frost. But at the same time, they're all connected to one another mentally. Now, with all that being said, you do have the sisters actually stop Destiny. And when they do, you have Destiny give them a prophecy. Now, this is a very huge prophecy because this is Jonathan Hickman basically saying down the road, something else is going to happen to the Stefford Cuckoos. Because what Emma Frost says is that, sorry Emma Frost, what Destiny says to the Stefford Cuckoos is that two of them will find love. The other three will never find love. But one of them, something very dramatic is going to happen to them in other world. And that comes down the road. And then you have her just walk away. And you're wondering, what does that mean? Which sister is going to find love? What happens to the rest of the sisters? And which one is going to have a huge dramatic moment in Otherworld? But either way, you have Destiny and Mystique go on to meet with Emma Frost. And so getting into the meeting between Mystique, Destiny, and also Emma Frost, this is where you have Emma Frost tell Destiny and Mystique, hey guys, by the way, I know that Mormon Tagger is not a human. I know that she is a mutant, but on top of that, she is alive. Now, like I said earlier, no one knew that she was a mutant. No one knew that she was alive, except Charles Xavier and Magneto, and now Emma Frost, and now Mystique and Destiny. Now, with that being said, Destiny realized what was missing in her life, because to her, she'd been telling herself something was missing. Something when it comes to her powers was missing. And now she knows it is more Metagger. And she was actually able to locate, not really locate, but now she can sense more Metagger, which means that now when it comes to Destiny powers, she fully understands everything about more Metagger. And that right there is a problem. Now, Emma Frost also tells them something very important, but she tells them that right after you have Mystique ask her, okay, whose side are you on? Now, Emma Frost says, there is no way I'll join your side. But at the same time, Charles Xavier and Magneto broke my trust. 
And so with that, I'm not on their side either. Now to Mystique, it sounds like Emma Frost is going to stay neutral and sit on the sideline. But she says, no, I have something to tell you, some kind of gift. And that gift is the location of where Mormon Tagger is actually at. Now, here comes the problem. Because while we're talking about Mormon Tagger, that is the moment she is confronted by a strike team that works for Ortris. And right now, they're here to take her away. And so it shows that somehow they were able to also find a location of where Mormon Tagger was at. Either way, they are going to take her away just like that but then we jump over to charles xavier and magneto now these are just two friends talking to one another about the future for the mutant race and right now it's really more of magneto asking charles xavier does he know about the future knowing that the future is not going to be great between humans and mutants that that bright future that charles wants so bad is never going to come because humans always hates mutants now, with that being said, though, you didn't have Magneto tell Charles, do you also realize that Emma Frost saw through our lies, that Emma Frost is now an enemy and no longer on our side? And before Charles is able to actually answer, that is the moment he realized that Mormon Taggart is trying to call out to him through her mind to tell him something is wrong, I'm being grabbed, I'm being taken away, I need you guys to save me. Now, this is a problem because right now, only Magneto and Charles could technically save her. Because remember, no one else knows that she's alive except Emma Frost, Mystique, and Destiny. But to Charles and Magneto, only Emma Frost knows. And so, they have to say more by themselves. Now, guys, this is where things get crazy. Because then you have Omega Sentinel and Nimrod having a conversation. Now, when it comes to this conversation, you have Nimrod look at Omega Sentinel. Now, when he does look at Omega Sentinel, he realizes that she is not from this time. Matter of fact, she is from the future. And that right there is very, very huge because he realized that she has something very important to tell him. And she says, yes, I am from the future, but here's the catch. I am from a future where mutants have won. That right there, just that right there says a lot. Because what she's saying right now in the future, humans and machines had lost the war against mutants. Which means that this timeline right here is destined to have the mutants win. And that, guys, is huge. Because when it comes to a lot of X-Men stories, usually the mutants lose. The humans or machines win, but mutants always lose. Not always, but most stories they do. And so right now, she's saying, no, this timeline is destined to have the mutants win. And what she says is that in her future, they made a Nimrod. They sent that Nimrod back in time. That Nimrod had failed because that Nimrod was supposed to help the humans or machines win the war in advance against mutants. But unfortunately, it failed. She didn't even said, even though machines and humans were both attacking the mutants, when Apocalypse came back with his family, bam, they lost the war. And guys, she doesn't even stop there. Because then she said, the mutants took over the entire solar system. And matter of fact, we have already seen that right now. Not the entire, but two planets, Earth, but also Mars, belongs to the mutants. Really just Mars, but the mutants are beginning to take over the Earth, just at a slow rate. Now, guys, I'm still not done. Because you have Omega say, when the mutants took over the solar system, you have powerful beings come by to try to help machines win. But the problem was, though, the mutants had the power of the phoenix on their side. And just like that, bam, 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 these powerful beings that came to help machines failed left and right, except one. And that one is actually very important. Because remember, Omega Sentinel is a hybrid, half human, half machine. And so with that being said, that one last powerful being sent her mind back in time to override her present day self to get the present ready 
for mutants to win or to hopefully prevent mutants from winning. And so right now, that is why she said she is from the future because her mind, her present day mind, has been replaced from a future version of herself. Now, we're still not done yet because what she says next is she is literally the creator of Orchid. She technically met up with director DeVito I said DeVito, oh my gosh, I don't know why. But she met up with Director D, and when she did, she said, hey man, you and I are going to work together to technically get ready to get rid of the mutant race. Now, what she did to his mind is technically let his mind experience her future. And when she did that, he believed that he had actually lived in that future, even though he never did. But either way, it was a way for him and her to work together to build this entire organization as a way to get rid of the mutant race. Literally, all of that right there all came from Omega Sentinel. But then, right after she's done talking to Nimrod, that is the moment they realize something is wrong. One of the bases that belongs to the organization, their alarms is going off in Terra Verde. And so you have Nimrod and Omega leave to handle that particular problem. But then we get back over to Magneto and Charles Xavier. Now remember, they're looking for more McTaggart. They have to find her. With that being said, though, they do go over to the Terra Verde base because when it came to Magneto and Charles Xavier, they put a tracker or what they believe was a tracker on Mormon Tagger. And so when they go there and try to look for her, when they get there, all the soldiers in this base, they have been slaughtered. But on top of that, they find the arm of Mormon Tagger. And so you're kind of wondering, wait a second, where in the world is she if she's not here? Because all these soldiers have been literally slaughtered. And that is the moment you had the story jump between two different settings. Charles Xavier Magneto at Terra Verde and Mystique and Destiny somewhere else with Mormon Tagger. They were able to grab her and take her somewhere else. Now, she believes that Charles and Magneto still have the ability to actually save her. But you have Mystique say, no, honey, that right there is not going to happen. And the reason why, because she knows what's next for Magneto and also Charles Xavier. They are going to be confronted by Nimrod, Omega Sentinel, and a bunch of soldiers from Ortris. And this is where things get rough for Charles Xavier and Magneto. And so getting into the final chapter of this storyline, and guys, we pick up with Magneto and Charles Xavier trying to figure out what in the world are they going to do? Because right now, they're surrounded by Nimrod, Omega Sentinel, and a bunch of soldiers who work for them. And so right now, Charles and Magneto are technically screwed. But then things get a tad bit crazy. Because then you have Omega Sentinel go ahead and kill off all the soldiers that came with them. Now, the reason why? Because they are humans. And this is the moment her and Nimrod announced that because they're machines, they hate humans as much as they hate mutants. But on top of that, it's them saying, your real threat here is no longer humans. Your real threat is us, machines. That is your real threat. You're trying to get that great future? Well, we're the only thing standing in your way. And so it does lead into a big battle between Charles Xavier, Magneto, against Nimrod and also Omega Sentinel. But here's the thing, y'all. Charles is ticked off. He wants to know where in the world more Metagger is at because he has no idea that it was Mystique and Destiny. He still believes Omega Sentinel and also Nimrod did something with her, even though they said, hey, we did nothing to her at all. But again, he still believes they did because her arm is at this base. But either way, it does lead into a battle between these four characters at this base. And so then we come to find out that Mora Metagger has been taken by Mystique and Destiny, but been taken to a particular place. And of course, it's the hidden place where Magneto, Charles Xavier, and Mormon Tagger will have their meetings on Kokoa, an area where Kokoa has no idea about, 
but really no one does on the island. It was a secret place. Now, with that being said, though, right now, you have Mormon Taggart telling Mystique and Destiny that they cannot kill her. And the reason why? Because remember, she can reincarnate. And if she does, the timeline technically resets because then she goes right back to the very beginning of her life with all the past memories of this life. And then, of course, she's able to do whatever she wants to do. And so it could change the timeline completely. But then you have Mystique say, don't worry, the timeline is not going to reset. And then she pulls a gun out and shoots more Metagger. But then we have to jump back in time. And when we do, we actually pick up with that meeting between Emma Frost, Destiny, and Mystique. Now remember, that meeting, it was really more of Emma Frost telling everything to Destiny and Mystique about the idea of more Metagger. One, she's not human. She's a mutant. Two, her powers. And three, she is here. But once Emma Frost had told Destiny everything about Mormon Taggart, Destiny realized what she had to do. Why Mormon Taggart is a problem for the mutant race. Right there, you see? She is the problem, not Destiny. And that is a huge change. Because remember, in the earlier parts of the story, it was Mormon Taggart telling Charles Xavier and Magneto that Destiny is the problem for the mutant race. But in reality, the main problem is really Mormon Taggart. She is the problem for the mutant race. Now, Emma Frost then says you cannot kill her though, because if you do, she'll be able to reset the timeline. But if you do kill her when she is a human, then the timeline does not reset, because then she does not have her powers to reincarnate, to come back to life again, or to relive her life all over again because she no longer has the mutant gene. Now for Mystique and Destiny, they are confused on how in the world they're going to kill Mormon Taggart, but not have her reincarnate. How is that possible? Because she's a mutant. We just can't take her X gene away like that. But then you have Emma Frost say, no, there is a way, because Forge made a gun. And when it came to this gun, it gives someone the ability to take someone else's mutant abilities away. And so if they use the gun, they can take more Metagger's powers away. And it's the gun we saw earlier Mystique used on more Metagger, which means Mystique had just taken away more Metagger's powers in the present day. And really, the next few pages are really used as a way to kind of Tell us how Mystique was able to get more Metagger. And really, it was kind of obvious that she technically used her ability as a way to change her appearance to look like one of the soldiers for Orcris and then being able to actually grab more Metagger and then bring her back to Charles Xavier's hideout on Kakoa. That was really it. Like, literally nothing else. Which, honestly, it's pretty cool to see it, but we already knew because... How else would Mystique get her without technically using her abilities? And so getting back into the present day, we actually pick up with Mystique, Destiny, and more Metagra's conversation. Now, this conversation is actually very important. And the reason why, because right now, they're going to kill her off. Because more Metagra is just a regular human being. Mystique did use the gun that was given to her by Emma Frost, the one Forge made, to take away someone's mutant ability. But here's the thing, though. When they kill off more Metagra, she will not reincarnate. Her X gene is gone. The timeline is not going to reset. But then you have Destiny say, this is a nexus point. And what she means by that. So when it comes to Destiny's powers, She's able to see possible futures, but she's also able to see outcomes of a certain moment, like what's going to happen in the future over a certain moment happening in the present day. But when it comes to this moment right here, she really can't see an outcome. She has no idea if this is going to lead into a bad thing or a good thing. Neither one. She has literally no idea. But it's them saying if we do kill her off, we can technically lock in this perfect timeline. Now, none of the characters here know that the future is that mutants win. But for Mormon Taggart, she especially believes that mutants are going to lose. Because remember, this is her 10th life. 
and her first two lives were really just her realizing she was a mutant. Her third life, she made a cure, but life four through nine, she really did try to help out the mutant race, but the mutant race always failed. It always lost. And right now, it's her believing that in her 10th life, it's going to be the same. But no one here realizes. No one here in the present day except Nimrod and also Omega Sentinel know that the future is guaranteed. The mutants actually win. But for Destiny and Mystique, they believe in that future. And so they want to lock in this timeline to make sure that she is not able to go back in time to change this timeline. And so, yes, they are going to kill her off. But there's one more thing. And guys, we saw this earlier because then you have Mormon Tiger say she really tried to make up another cure for the mutant race. She was going to use the cure once again to cure the mutant race like she did back in her third life. But Destiny stopped her. But because Destiny was not around in this timeline for a good period of time, Mora was able to recreate this cure, and she was going to use that cure on the mutant race. She was going to, but now it seems like she can't. But getting back over to Charles Xavier and Magneto fighting against Nimrod and Omega Sentinel, their battle still goes on. It goes on for a few pages, up to a certain point where you actually have Charles Xavier powers get canceled out. And when his powers do get canceled out, you know what that means? He is now technically powerless, pointless. And so Nimrod is able to grab him and you have Nimrod say, stop right now. Now at the same time Nimrod was able to grab Charles, Magneto grabbed Omega Sentinel. And so right now it's Nimrod saying, I'll let Charles Xavier go if you let my friend Omega go. Now for Magneto, he does not want to go through this deal at all. He's down in killing off Omega and then going after Nimrod. But then you have Charles remind us, the readers, but also Magneto, if they die, they're going to forget this moment. Because remember, Cerebro does keep up all the memories of every single mutant on Earth, except right up to the point they die meaning that their death is not recorded in Cerebro. And so they have no idea what actually happened to them up to that moment right there. And so if they die, they're going to forget about Nimrod and Omega and the idea that they don't have more at all, meaning that someone else has more Metagger. But on top of that, they're going to forget about this base as well. And so as Charles told Magneto, we cannot die. Because if we do die, we are going to forget about this moment. But unfortunately, you do have Magneto agree to the deal to let Omega go so Nimrod can let Charles go. Nimrod lied. And you have Nimrod and Omega go ahead and kill off Magneto and Charles Xavier. They were tricked and they died just like that. But getting back over to Mystique and Destiny, this is where you're going to have Mystique kill off Mora Metagger, except that is the moment you have Cypher appear. Now, when Cypher does appear, it's huge. And the reason why? Because it is Cypher right now saying, I've been watching everything and you cannot kill her off. Now, the reason why Cypher is saying that, because Mystique and Destiny, who are now part of the Quiet Council, would be breaking a huge law. And remember, that law they made says mutants cannot kill humans anymore. And so with that law being in effect, that means right now, if Mystique kills off Mormon Tagger, who's no longer a mutant, she's now just a regular human, it would be them breaking the law. And they'll be sent in the same pits with Sabretooth and Toad. And Mystique and Destiny both know they do not want that at all. Now, you have Mystique say, you know what? I'll just kill you off. But then you have Destiny stop her. And the reason why she does stop Mystique, because Destiny knows that out of three futures, none of them goes in favor for Mystique. But on top of that, Cypher brought back up Warlack, Kakoa, his wife. Right now, when it comes to Mystique, she does not stand a chance at all. But on top of that, it's Destiny telling her, I've seen three different kinds of futures. And technically, the first two does not go well for us at all. And so we have no choice but to actually let 
more Metagger go. Now, Destiny does say that she's having a hard time seeing a future for more Metagger, but she does know that Mora is going to have a long and hard journey in her future. A lot of hard choices, but those choices are going to decide her future. And so right now, Mystique has no choice but to let Mora go because her wife Destiny says, we literally have no choice here. This boy has stopped us from actually doing what we wanted to do. So yes, let her go. But to wrap up today's video, we actually do pick up with that moment where you had Emma Frost bringing Charles Xavier and Magneto back to life. What we saw at the very beginning of this video. And right now is her saying that, listen, I kept you guys dead for a week, but then I had the five bring you guys back to life. But while you were gone, I told the Quiet Council everything you guys did. They now know everything, which means the Quiet Council as a group will hold on to this secret about what you guys did with this island, with more. But let you know right now, even though we're all guilty, Charles Xavier, you are the most in all when it comes to being guilty because it was you first who began this journey of keeping more a secret. And so because you were first, you get to hold most of the guilt, but we all hold the rest. Either way, it ends with more being gone and Kakoa being able to live on with Destiny being back. And now the Quiet Council knows the secret of Charles Xavier and Magneto. But this begins a new start for X-Men comics as Hickman leaves the book forever. Not forever. He might come back, I don't know, 10 years. Either way, it's over. And so with that being said, guys, this is where we are going to end today's comic book video. So please leave me a like down below and subscribe. But guys, I'll see y'all next time. Later.